Hi there, my name is Hugh Salkine, and I'm going to be doing a demonstration on a montage bead for you. Um, I'm teaching a class here at the studio at the Courtney Museum of Glass, and um, I'm going to put together a four piece and calmo sectioned uh, hollow pendant, is what I refer to them as. And it's going to look similar to something like this, but I'm going to put one together from scratch from you. But some of the, pre, some of the elements I've pre made in this so that I don't have to uh, go through the length and uh, I don't have to go through how much long, how long it's going to take to make. Um, the uh, process is uh, uh, kind of complicated, so I'm going to just line it up here. I've pre-made some elements for it, but I'm going to show you an element or two in, on the, the film so that you can see how it's done, and then I'm going to put the grand design together. So this is a piece of uh, line tubing that I created the other day. Um, it's uh, a purple wisteria color with a heavy blue leprechaun next to it. And it's uh, encased on the inside and the outside with clear. And I'm going to do what's commonly known in our industry as a reversal. And this is going to be one of the elements of the four that I'm going to put together. So I had that little point on there for a reason, so when I went into the flame, I didn't have any issue about this cracking. I didn't have to preheat it. And I'm turning it as it's cooling down, so I'm staying on center. And with just a small flame on the torch here, I'm going to twist it in one direction. And I'm going to let that cool down, twist it in another direction, and then change its axis. And that's the, and the, so the term for this is what's known as a reversal. A lot of younger people might know this as a wigwag. Um, a little bit about me I, while I'm doing this is I've been blowing glass. I've been working on the torch for 27 years. Um, I was, uh, there's a gentleman named Bob Snodgrass who was the guy who got me into glass and I was his first apprentice. I got him to move to Eugene in 1990. Um, and I just happened to be a young kid at the right place at the right time it seems like because I'm um, now here teaching in front of all you guys. So um, this is uh, how we used to do it back in the day. And when I say back in the day, I mean the early 90s. So not that long ago in my mind, but for a lot of other people's minds, it was a long time ago. So I just twist it one direction. I'll take it out of the flame, give it a little puff. Let it cool down for a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to go in and heat now this section up here and twist it the other direction. And I'm twisting my lines, but I'm not twisting it all that much just to get a little color effect. And I'm going to shrink this down, so twisting it a little bit will look a lot more intense as I shrink this down. And I'm starting off with something relatively basic so that you guys might be able to wrap your head around what I got going on. I have some pre-made elements. Like I said before, this might take a long time if I was to do it from start to finish with all these pre-made elements. Some of the pre-made elements I made took a little bit over an hour to make. And this live stream, I believe they only want to be about an hour. So I had to make some pre-made elements for this. Straightening out my punty. And now I'm going to neck it down a little bit right here, or pull it down. Just a small flame. I'm just using my center fire of the Carlisle. This is the way I know where one of my termination points is going to be when I take it off this and reverse its axis. And that I will show you in a second. So this is still hollow through there. I'm able to get my breath up into the piece and manipulate the what's in my uh, left hand. I'm going to use a little bit of a bigger flame. Sometimes I rest my punty on the 
the heat shield of the Carlisle, so it acts as a third hand. It would be really nice to have a third hand, but I haven't met one of those guys yet. But if you ever do, tell them to become a glass blower. So now I'm going to make this into relatively a ball shape. And I'm going to have to manipulate this a little bit more to make it nice and even. Pulling the end down until it looks about even where I want it to be. And I'm just going to fire cut that, put that in my break off bucket, which just has a little bit of a stainless steel can with a little bit of water in the bottom. I only use about an inch of water in the bottom because I just want to put out hot glass and weight the can down. I don't use water for breaking my glass off. I find that to be sometimes a little bit problematic with what I'm doing. Um, so that's what I have going on right here. So I just break the very tip of that off and it's very small, I blow through it and feel it with my hand and make sure there's air coming through it and then I immediately seal it back up. But where I'm going to seal, where I'm going to put the flame to seal this back up is right about here, um, not quite on the tip. If I put the flame right on the tip of this piece here, it's just going to boil. And what I'm making is a termination and I want my termination to be as clean as possible. So this is the best way I've been able to find it to make a clean termination and something that I can magnify quite a bit and it's still, they come together because uh, this glass that I'm working is clear on the inside, clear on the outside with color in between. So by opening it up like that, it allows the glass to seal like this instead of pulling a fine stringer on that or having any kind of point. I find this just to be the cleanest termination point I've been able to come up with. And so that's why I do it. And show you in a second. Of course, it's glowing, so it's going to be hard to see. For the camera, you might be able to see how fine that termination point is. And I'm going to do that again on the other side after I remove this and put a tube on it. So I have some a tube that I'm going to stick this on, which will be this piece of 9 mil heavy wall. And I heat the end up just to make sure it's not going to crack on me. And I'm now going to pop a hole in the side of this. Actually, I might turn this a little bit more into a ball shape. This torch has got a center fire and an outer fire. It's a kind of a torch inside of a torch. And so when I want to do something larger, like manipulate this ball, I'll put on the larger flame, which is what you hear now. And most of my work is going to be done with a smaller flame. And on these torches in particular, the small flame is a premix center fire, which means the gas is mixed in the torch, so it's a little bit noisy, but it has a different flame chemistry than a lot of other glass blowing torches where they're all surface mixed. The outer fire on this right now is a surface mix, so the gases are actually being uh, mixed right at the surface of the tip of this torch. And hence the name surface mix. And some people find that to be an advantage or disadvantage on the torch, depending on what you're working on and what style you work on. I've worked on one of these torches now for about 25 of the 27 years I've been blowing glass, and so I'm very comfortable with them, and they are good torches. If you're watching this, Mary, hi. <laughs> so I popped a hole inside, I blow through it to open it up a little bit more, and that's why I have it still on the handle so I could use my breath to open it up and if that hole didn't work out where I wanted it to I could seal it back up and start over again. So at this point I'm going to attach this tube onto there, onto the hole and take it off the other piece. And I look at it in this direction and I look at it in this direction. If I don't find these two directions I don't get a real 90 degree connection and that's what I want because I'm going to take it off 
and we're reversing its axis, so the 90 degree part of it is very important. And I pulled it down so I know where to pull it off with the flame. So I just fire cut that. Set that down here. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did on the other side. I'm going to pull it thin, break a little hole into it, and then seal it back up. I know it seems a little redundant, but this is how I find to make the nicest termination points possible. So I make it thin. I'm just using a 4 mil rod as my punty. And so I know it's thin if my 4 mil rod can just break that off. Again, blow a little hole in it. And any time I break something off, there might be a small chunk of glass. And that's the other reason for blowing into it. If there is anything, it'll just disappear. <clears throat> Again, not putting the flame right on the tip of that termination because that glass is so thin it'll want to boil. And so by using the, what I call the side splash of the flame, I'm allowing that termination to get thicker so that when I do put a lot of heat onto it, it won't boil in that spot. So sometimes I use the side of the flame, sometimes I use the center of the flame. And also what you'll notice while I'm working is that I'm the, putting the glass a lot closer to the torch with the center fire, because it is two torches in one, the, uh, the premix torch part of it, what I'm using right now, the hottest part or what we call the sweet spot of the, so the flame is right here where the inner cone meets the outer flame. So that's why I'm holding it right here. Um, when I turn the outer fire on, which I'm about to do in a second, you'll see me hold it out a little further because actually the sweet combustion spot's about out here. And if I put it close like I did the other one, then it'll end up boiling the glass. So we don't have any kind of real temperature gauge on our torches, so we just kind of move it a little further out in the flame to, uh, to lower the temperature. And this isn't quite round, so that's what I'm doing now is I'm rounding it up. It's getting kind of floppy, so I've got to keep a nice constant rotation. And if it gets out of hand, I'll just take it out of the flame and let it cool down, and it'll go back into something that'll be easier to work. Again, I have been doing these for an awful long time, so I let it flop around a little bit. It's kind of fun. I'm going to heat it on the end here and blow it out a little bit so it's thin. So when I go to attach this to another piece, this, again, is just one of the four elements of the bead I'm going to do. So I want to be able to attach another tube onto this side or another piece onto that side. So I blew it thin, and I'm going to put my punty and now work on the seal. That is just a tack seal right now. If I was to let that cool down, and I usually let most of these just bench cool because they are thin and even. They usually have no problems just cooling down on the bench, but I have to make sure that it's nice and even. And where that seal is on there, it's a tack seal. Um, so it's lumpy and bumpy and chunky. And if it was to cool down, it would probably crack. Or when I go back into the flame, it would probably crack. So by making this into a nice, even, consistent wall thickness of the seal, it'll make it easier to work in the long run. And um, I could put this in the kiln and keep it warm. If you're ever nervous about the elements that you're making, always put them in the kiln and garage them in the kiln. But um, if you're comfortable not, just keep them out of the kiln, which I'm going to do here. I do have one of my pre-made elements in the kiln because it's a small, small disc, and it took me about an hour to make. And we don't have enough time on this live stream to see all that. So even I get nervous about some of my stuff. I'll just go back one more time to make sure that's a decent seal. And because I'm making some nice artwork here, I really want to have my seals very perfected. I'm working borosilicate glass, and borosilicate glass comes out of the scientific glass industry. And so um, I want to make it nice and even, and I want those seals to be better than what you would normally do on any kind of scientific apparatus and for the fact that I'm going to be going in and out of the flame several times. And again, the wall thickness that's consistent on the glass makes for strong glass. So 
So now you can see a little bit of what I was doing, changing its axis. So now I'm just finding it into a shape that is a little bit more desirable for me. And also rounding it up a little bit more. Because bore silicate has a tendency to have a bit of memory to it. And that means that it, because I'm changing its axis, it really wants to go oval and not really round. So I'm having to melt it back round so it has a new memory to it. And this memory will be of being round this way. These techniques originally came out of German glass, the lamp working. Um, that used mostly Lausche glass, which has almost no memory to it. So it aids in these process a little bit better. But that glass is a little bit more um, difficult, I find, to manipulate on the torch, where these glasses right here that we're using were designed to work on a torch specifically. Specifically, not specifically, sorry. So. That's the piece there. I pulled the point on the top again, so when this is at room temperature, I could go in and just heat that very tip, and the heat will sink into the piece, and I won't have to really about worry about it cracking. If I was to leave it just dome shape, when I go into there, the heat's going to go around it, and it's going to find the weakest point, it's probably going to crack. So I leave all my elements like this. The pre-made one I made before is this size, so now I have two to decide which one I want to put on my piece, and it's sometimes nice to have uh, options of what, when you're putting something together, to have a couple extra pieces. So I'm just going to put this in the, the point rest I have right here, which is just a, a drilled out block of wood, and I'll just set it here, actually, because I'm running out of spice in there. I just want to keep it off the uh, table, because the table's metal, and it'll want to suck the heat out of it a lot more. So I'm going to start putting this together. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll show you guys one more interesting one real quick, and that will be a four-way reversal. And this is a piece of vacuum encased tubing from uh, Golden Gate Glass. If you're watching Dave and Saeed, hi. How you doing? This stuff is pretty neat. I don't know the name or number of this piece, but it's um, a couple of different colors with some very fine stringer put in between the colors that have, have a little sparkle to it. The vacuum encasing technique is something that I don't really do all that much, so I don't mind buying pre-made tube. I find it takes a lot of the uh, time out of making my preparatory work for my finished pieces. So that's why I'm using this piece right here. And they do very beautiful work. So I like to support my friends and companies that have stuff that works out well. So for this one, I'm going to just get it a little warm here first with a center fire, and then I'm going to turn on the outer fire. I'm going to heat up a section and pull it down. This is a little thick and big right now the way I want it. So I'm going to manipulate it and form it into the shape that will be more conducive to what I'm making. So I'm just going around and around and rocking it back and forth. So I'm heat evenly heating about an inch, inch and a half of this glass. And I could tell by the glow of the glass, the even heat base that's in there. And let's see here. And pull a little bit more of this down. It's always better to have a little more material than a little less material. down so it's a consistent thickness and that's now probably about 15 millimeter wide instead of being about 22 millimeters wide and it'll just be a little bit easier for me to manipulate and I'll turn off that large flame 
When I first started, before we had all these fancy colors, our most expensive thing that we dealt with was oxygen. Because the glass, the clear glass is relatively inexpensive, and I do a lot of silver and gold fuming because I learned from gentlemen who kind of came up with the whole metal deposition fuming process. Um, so I normally known for that, not so much doing this color work, but now that we have these beautiful colors, um, and uh, so I try to take advantage of it, and especially in jewelry, it looks really nicely, or it looks really nice, and that's what I'm doing now. When I started in 1990, um, there was only 29 colors from a company called Northstar that were available for us to really work with, and they hadn't had enough time to really refine their colors down to where they all worked as well as they do now. Now our color palette's about 400 colors on the market uh, from several different companies. And so we have quite a variety. And so I like to take advantage of that and that's where we come up with stuff like this. And so I'm just gonna take what I, doing now is I'm mentally taking this section right here and chopping it into four parts and I'm taking one quarter of it and giving it a twist and that's going to be one part, one element of this design. This will be a four-way terminated reversal. It's a mouthful. So I'm just twisting it in one direction. Coming out of the flame and letting it cool down. And again, I'm not twisting it a whole bunch because sometimes when making things small, the more you twist it, the, uh, the less you'll lose the detail as it gets smaller. So as that cools down, I'm gonna use my small flame and pull a point so I know where it's gonna be terminated at. And it also thins out the glass so when I go back in the flame, I'm not worried about it cracking. And I'm gonna open this end up and put this on a tube. <clears throat> so sometimes you'll see me having a couple rods in my hand um, or what I'm doing and right now is I'm picking it open with this rod here and I have another rod that I use as my punty. So they're the same size but they're two different things. And so here I'm just pulling the glass nice and thin so that I can break open the end and make a hole. I could also do that with my tweezers here. And it just wasn't quite thin enough. So I'm just gonna pull it again, gonna break it off with the tweezers. Then actually with these tweezers, these are tungsten tweezers, they're kind of nice. And um, I just, put them in there and use them as like mini jacks and open up that hole a little bit. And I also have a reamer. And because I'm on the road, my reamer's made out of brass. At home, all my reamers are made out of graphite. But if I bring graphite on the road, graphite is the same thing that's inside of a pencil. It's very fragile and it tends to break. So I have lost several tools over the years, so I've learned to do something about it. And um, it's a a custom uh, a reamer made by a friend of mine, Sean Tucker, out of Oregon, Grants Pass, Oregon. So any of you tool manufacturers out there see that, it's a very, very handy tool. Again, same thing. I crack it open, flare it a little bit. using the reamer, so I make it about the same size. I don't really need to flare it very much. That's why I made the opening about the same size as the tube. And I'm gonna seal these two together. Oops. Uh, so. Again, that is just a tack seal. And that's just so I could take this end off and put a punty on there. And that way I don't have to, I have one end closed, so I'll be able to blow into it. When I first started blowing glass, I used a lot of corks. I would have this together and put a cork in the end of it. Um, and I found that that was just kind of cumbersome. So I tried to work 
where I can always blow into a dead end so when I want to uh, inflate the ball that I'm working on, I don't have to use too much lung pressure. And the pile of corks that I have at home is just getting dusty. And um, on that note, since I am a teacher and I teach a lot of students, I see a lot of people using earplugs as corks. If you ever melt those onto the glass, um, they make horrible staining and they're not so good for you. There's a reason why there's corks out there. So that's my little bit of advice. Earplugs are for ears, corks are for corking. So now I'm just making that seal really nice. Again, because I'm going to let this bench cool, and I'm going to pick it up and manipulate it in the torch. So I need my wall thickness to be incredibly even, so I don't have to worry about garaging it in the kiln. And I'm going to take this end off and pull it to a little bit of a point, and then I set it down and start working on another piece that's going to be attached to this. here and again this tube cooled down quite a bit so that's why I have this point on there by heating up the very small piece of glass it allows the heat to sink in there so I don't have to worry about it cracking I made it a little thicker on the end so when I put my punty on there it'll have a nice purchase on the glass And the glass connections are incredibly strong. The, hand, the punty that I'm using is a four mil punty. It's the size that I'm comfortable with. For making small objects, I find it's completely appropriate. But this piece of glass that's in my right hand is relatively heavy, but I can hold it with just the weight of that four mil without a problem, so. That's why I'm using the four mil. It tends to slip through my fingers right, nice and easily, and I have a nice control over it. Just twist this one way and then twist it the other, which is similar to what I did in that first ball. So just about like that. Come out, give it a little puff. That way I know it's thin and consistent. And I go back in the flame, I'm just going to heat up this section right above it and twist it the opposite direction. This technique is also goes back to the early 90s. And it might go back a lot further, but in my lifetime, we did an awful lot of these in Eugene in the early 90s. So some of these patterns have been around for a long time, and as far as I know, these patterns have, some of these patterns have been done for probably 100 years or so. Or maybe even longer. But not with this type of glass. So I'm working in a new medium of glass. but I really like detailed pattern work and that's why I'm doing all this. So, again, this is gonna be a termination point, so I'm gonna pick it small and take the end off. And open it up, give it a little Tap in my tap bucket, or break off bucket. It wasn't very thin, so I didn't want to do it very evenly, so I'll do that again. I'm doing this so I don't have to blow a bubble or 
tried to open with any other force. I just got it real thin and just tapped it off. Again, not putting the flame right on the tip of it. I ended up getting a couple of air bubbles in this. So that tells me where I want to put my tube on the side of this is where those air bubbles are. So by popping it open, I'll be able to remove those air bubbles at the same time. So again, I'm gonna kind of heat it up, puff into it and raise it up a little bit. So I know where to put the hole and the hole this time I'm gonna blow into the flame itself. that with just my breath and not a reamer. So it's nice and even and consistent. And now I'll open this one up and attach the two of them together. Again, whenever I break something off, there might be a little chunk of glass, so I usually blow into it. Put my reamer in the hole and then get it to the size that I want the same size so when they go together I don't have to really change the sizes very much. So I'm putting one on top of another. Again looking at it from this angle and looking at it from this angle. So I want these to be real 90 degrees to each other or a right angle. <clears throat> so I go and just do my fire cut. Set that down and do the process over again. And I'm gonna melt in this termination point so it's nice and crisp. And then after that, I'm gonna turn on the bigger flame and turn it back into a ball shape. Again, going back to the memory of the glass, for still good, has a lot of memory. And how it is shaped this way, kind of like a football, um, it'll wanna blow out that way. So I'm gonna use the bigger flame and really heat it and get it to go round again. Creating a new memory in the glass. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm using a larger flame. And it's a little less noisy for you guys on the other end of this. So you can hear my voice instead of just the hiss of the torch. Now here, I'll give another little puff. You get it to go relatively round. Blow the end a little bit out to make it a little bit thinner. Turning off that outer fire so I don't waste a lot of gas and also I don't need a large flame for what I'm doing. doing this, I'm looking for the thickness of the wall. So I just spent all this time making this pattern. I don't want to remove a lot of the pattern, so I made it very thin where I'm putting this connection. So when I take it off, if it takes a little glass along with it, it's not removing the, all the work that I just put into it. Putting handle on, so it's straight on access. That way when I turn it, it's easier to stay centered. Now I'm going to work on that seal. And this would be for, referred to as an end seal. So 
So I want to make it nice and even. And because this uh, tubing is opaque, I cannot see through it. Um, I really need to judge how thick it is by how it blows out, how evenly it blows out, and how nicely it feels in the hand. And that way, I know the wall thickness is consistent and not lumpy and chunky, because I cannot see through this. Just about where I want it to be. And I'm going to actually make one more section and attach it to this. So this is why I was saying I have some pre-made elements for this piece that I just made because some of these take an awful long time. And basically I'm just showing you some of the easier ones right now or less steps. I'm just looking at the clock, see what time I got. Again, I'm just going to let that sit and let it bench cool while I'm working on another element. So again, I'm going to do what I did the very first on this piece, on this pattern work is attach a punny and give it a, just a single twist in one direction. And so I'm just using a small flame so I have an easier time manipulating this glass and getting it to go where I want it to. And then, uh, depending on which way I twist this, will uh, in the finished piece have a different effect. So it's good to pay attention if you're twisting it to the right or to the left. So I was just glancing over at the other two pieces I put together just to make sure that this is the right size and I needed to put it back in the flame and make it a little bit longer and a little bit more twisted. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to pull it down and attach it to the other piece. Up the same way, we're pulling it thin. Coming over here to my break off bucket, setting it down on there and tapping it. And if it doesn't come off real easily, I just use my tweezers. Whenever you want to use these two fingers on your glass, that's where the tweezers are. If I was to actually use my fingers, they'd be really, really hurt by now. The glass that we're working with um, is borosilicate glass, like I said before, and it melts at around 2,000 degrees. We can only really touch something about 150 degrees, so we try not to use our fingers. It tends to make for bad days. And going over to this piece here, now I'm going to pick it up and again open this up and attach these together. just to make sure I'm going to use this other rod.
I am just wiping it off to open it up. Blow through it. I'll use my reamer to ream it open. This is commonly known as a four-way reversal because this will have four termination points when I'm done. But with the same technique, you can make as many termination points as you would like. And sometimes people really want to get into it and do them a lot more, but you see how long this, just this one element takes. If I was to make a 12-sided reversal or something like that, it would just take a lot longer. But with the same set of techniques, you could do almost any of that. So I gotta wait till my punny cools down. So it has a good handle. Now I have a handle on both sides, so it's easier to manipulate this thin tube tubing of glass. And also, I, because I twist it in a specific direction, I don't want to untwist it. So having a handle on the other side makes that a lot easier. Now I'm going to take all three of these sections and turn them into one ball and then reverse the axis again. So for this, I might actually put the big flame back on so I can shrink this all that back down. I'm just getting it hot, allowing it to gather on itself. I'm not pushing or pulling on it. I'm getting these encamos to turn into one piece. I guess it's actually one piece. I'm just getting it to turn into more of a ball type shape. So I'm heating it back and forth, allowing it to gather on itself so it turns into a ball. That's well, about the shape I desire. Just one more heat. Turn out that large flame. And because I'm gonna put this on another tube, I'm gonna pull down the end here so I know where, my ter one of my, where one of my terminations is gonna be. So it's still open. This piece, I'm gonna pull the end off and make a termination. This will be one of the four when we're done. Again, just so I can feel some air go through there, that's why I put my hand in front of it. There's a little hole, it's really hard to see. I can't even see it, but I can feel it, so I know it's there.
but since this is a little larger, I might put it on this, or I might, this is a piece of 9.5 uh, tubing. I'm looking at it to see if I should do this or a little bit thicker, and I think I could get away with using the smaller stuff. The other size would be 12 millimeter. And you'll see that here in a second um, when I make the back of the bead that I'm working on, which will be one solid color. So all this little detail that you see will be on the front of the bead, not on the back. Getting the holes just big enough to fit my reamer in there. Flare it open just a little bit. And while I'm doing that, this allowed this to cool down enough so where I could pop a hole and I don't have to worry about it going in the wrong direction. So I want this hole to be relatively in the middle of my ball. together and take this other side off. Again, looking at it from two different angles so that I know it's at a real 90 degree angle. Now I'll terminate this side and put on the big flame and turn this into a ball. And then I'll actually start constructing the bead itself. But I just wanted to show you what some of these elements are because some of the elements I have pre-made, but I wanted you a good idea of what how I made these. Closing up that hole and heating around it until it thickens up. And I can put on the big flame, turn this back into a ball. Sometimes when I'm doing this, I'll back up a little bit just and I'm doing that for the heat's sake because it is a little warm. I'll drink a little water because I do get dehydrated. Helps with the voice too. This is my second week of uh, being out here teaching. And last week I TA'd for a lady named Sue Ellen Fowler who did a live stream last week. And she's someone I've been working with for the last seven years. And she's a very good friend of mine. And she does fantastic work. I definitely suggest looking her up. And that's who initially brought me here to the Corner Museum of Glass was Sue Ellen. Well, actually, what initially brought me here was the gas conference, but after that, Sue Ellen said, hey, do you want a TA for me? And I said, yes, absolutely. The facility here is top notch. I actually live in Eugene, Oregon, and I travel all the way across the country to New York to come and teach here because the facility is that nice. Now I got it relatively a ball shape. I'm gonna puff out this end and put a handle on it. And just finish this off, make the seal kind of nice. And then I said, like I said before, I'm gonna actually construct this bead. And I'm gonna go over an hour, it looks like, but from what I've been told, they don't mind that too much. I 
And after making this part, I think it looks a little bit big for what I'm doing, and that's why I pre-made some sections. So I have a choice. Also, I find if I make two of something, then each one will work relatively well. If I only make one, it's probably going to break. And that's just something called Murphy's Law. That's something I believe in. And if you're out there, Jim Murphy, have one for me. You know what that means. Actually, while I'm doing this and rounding it up, the gentleman I learned from is a guy named Bob Snodgrass. He's out in Eugene, Oregon. He's uh, still producing quite a bit of glass, having a good time. And he learned in Ohio from a guy named Chuck Murphy, another Murphy. And so that's a little bit of his lineage. I'm just trying to make the wall thickness pretty consistent so I can again set this down and not have to worry about the cracking. That I think is a little large, but I'm going to set this down over here. And I'm going to start with my background color, which is this. Actually, one thing I'm going to do before I start on that, is I'm going to pull a little stringer of some color. And this is what I'm going to use to sign my initials with on the back. I tend to sign all of my work. Actually, I do sign all of my work. Um, and I do that because I like my work, and it hopefully it'll be around a lot longer than I will be. And so people will know exactly who made it. If you're proud of your work, sign it, and, and maybe even date it, because it will be around a lot longer. That way people don't want have to attribute it to somebody who didn't make it or to the school of in the future. And some of these things that we make might last for an awful, awful long time. And if we look at ancient glass, most of it is not signed. If it was, we'd know exactly when and where it was made. So. Something to think about. So this is a, a piece of tubing from North Star Glass. It is cobalt blue on the outside and it is a sparkly color on the inside called unobtainium. And it's just their uh, sparkly blue. So it's two sparkly blues. The outside is translucent, the inside is opaque. So it makes for a nice satiny sheen. So I'm just gonna open that hole up a little bit. I like working with this tubing. It's very beautiful. And this is on a thicker handle because this piece is going to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to start with one of my pre made elements. And this one looks a little bit more the consistent size that I'm looking for. So I'll open the end of this four-way reversal up. And open nicely just like that. about the same size. Attach these two together. This one can be a little bit bigger.
So when I stuck those together, they were extremely even, so I had to correct it by pulling it over a little bit. So again, I want to be able to blow into this, so I'm going to take this tube off so I have a place to blow into it and work back on that seal again. And this ball that I'm working on right now is the same pattern I just showed you guys. It's just not twisted. We actually left the line straight and gives it a little bit different effect, but it's the same thing. But because I'm going to be putting four sections together, um, size really kind of counts. Because I want this to be a piece of jewelry. I don't want this to be a large sculpture. Just making sure the seal is nice. So I'm first heating on the blue tubing. Blowing into it, make it a little bit bigger. And also I just know the wall thickness by how my breath puffs it out and how hot it is. And this now became two sections, or technically now we have five sections, but, or four, something like that. But I'm just going to keep compounding it and putting other pieces on. When attaching these, sometimes I use the term just attaching two balls together, but also you heard the word encalmo, and that's what the word encalmo means, is just join two pieces of glass together. Being careful not to pull out any of my pattern. So I worked, obviously, a long time on it, as you guys just saw. So. I'll open this up again. Now put another section on the end of this. And let's see, that one might be a little big, so I'm going to go with this guy here. Again, the pieces of the pre-made or the pieces I showed you on camera were a little on the big side, so you guys can get the idea of the detail in this piece. Because this piece is going to have a lot of small detail. So that's why I pre-made some of these elements. And because I'm doing something with two points to it, I'm going to actually line these up a little bit so that the reversal meet the reversal relatively. For something as small as this, I could also just heat it without a punty on the end and work on the seal. This is a little bit haphazard, so if you're trying this at home, you might want to put a punty on this. That's the noontime whistle, if you guys heard that in the background. Here in Corning, they still use a steam whistle, 
several times a day to let you know what time it is if you don't have a watch. And so they have a, that steam whistle that went off in the background tells me that it's noon right now. And yes, in my head, I always think of the Flintstones. So that's two sections put on this blue tubing. I'm going to do one more section on there. And the other section, again, took me a while. These are just one, one of them's a, a normal reversal. And that's the one I just put on there. The one that the first one I put on there was a four-way reversal. And this next one is what's called a bow tie or a double bow tie. Make that hole a little bigger. So I'm going to grab this other element that I actually have in the kiln because this one actually took me an hour also, and it's very small. <laughs> Sorry, just looking around, see around me. I've been staring at my piece for so long. Actually, what I want is I see a little bit of kiln dust, and this is normally doesn't happen to me. So normally, I have kiln furniture I set stuff up on. So I'm just using a little piece of paper wipe off that little bit of kiln dust. And that piece of paper, there's a tissue actually, will create a little bit of carbon on the glass and that will just come off in the flame. So this is gonna be what I call an end cap. And this is that double bow tie section. I'm gonna work on that seal and now I'm gonna shrink this whole piece down into one bead. Now with the bigger flame, I'm going to now start shrinking this all back down into a ball shape again. And some parts of this are thicker and thinner, so I'm trying to be real careful just to let it collapse on itself, not pushing or pulling. And all these pieces are going to get significantly smaller by doing this. because those colored elements I put on the front or the patterns are just going to be the front of the bead, not the back of the bead. I have to really say I have to really large and or make this uh, blue tube a lot larger.
So by doing this, I'm basically controlling the size of the bead that I'm going to make by gathering this blue tube. Again, I'm not really pushing. I'm allowing it to gather on itself. That's probably about the right size right there. So now I'll carefully collapse these other sections into a flat section. Okay, now I'm going to take this handle off. And I probably could have just taken that as a cold seal. I probably could have just taken it off by giving it a little tap. But because I have so much detail in these little elements, I don't want to lose any. So whenever in doubt, always fire cut. And that's what I'm doing right now. And those little stringers always go in the tap can so they don't go in my finger or in anybody else's. I'm going to use the bigger flame now and I'm going to shrink this all down. While I'm doing that, I get a little water. Uh, my TA for this class is Jeremiah Kern. And he's usually along with me when I do my solo classes here. He's a little younger than me, so he has the younger element, which is nice. Uh, and I might have him grab me something here in a second. But in one minute, we'll see. And basically, I said that to you so he doesn't run out of the room. I'm being careful not to twist any of these. I'm letting them collapse down onto themselves. And this is going to be kind of a flat shape, so I'm making sure it's real flat. Jeremiah, will you do me a favor and refill this for me? Yeah, Thank you. This big flame is significantly warm, so I'm getting a little more water so I can talk with you all and not get too dehydrated because it is really warm in back of this flame. There's a lot of radiant heat coming out the glass itself also. If you just set it down there, that'd be great. Thank you. It's also an easy way to get him in the shot, guys. So depending on if I hold this down, it'll elongate, or if I hold it this way, it'll shrink itself back down. So I'm just making it real even. Just using a little finesse. And because it's been turning for well over an hour now, it gets a little tired, so I switch hands. I'm 
so now I should be able to put a punty on the front of this. Well, actually, I'm going to pop the holes first, and then put a punty on the front and take off the back. Okay, so you kind of start seeing the detail that's involved there, even though it's all one color right now. The beautiful color of orange. That will change as it cools down. So now I have to decide where I want my holes so this sits as a pendant or a bead, just like this. So I am going to look at my pattern as it cools down and I'm going to blow out two little sections and then um, make those into holes and and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see here. I think I'm just going to go with right about here. And so I'm heating it up near the, the end cap or the front of the bead, which is significantly thicker. I'm just going to blow into it, puff it up a little bit. Again, if I don't like where that is, I can always shrink it back down. That's not too bad. So I'm going to go over here and do the same thing. look pretty even. So those are a lot thinner. So I'm just going to blow them to make it even a little thinner. So I can open them up. I'm just going to pull them thin and pop them open. Did not do what I wanted to, so heat it back up, do it again. I actually ripped open a little hole. I'm gonna make that hole a little bigger by blowing into it. I'm gonna do that on the other side. So now I have two holes in there, but if to actually get a string there would be relatively hard because it would just want to float around. So I'm going to use a tungsten pick. I'm going to heat up both my holes and pull them up a little bit. So it'll be easier to string because this is a piece of jewelry. So I'm heating in the center of the two dots and kind of pulling up a little bit. Pull it down in that case, actually, but I'm just raising it up so that I want this pick to be able to pass right through those two holes. So now the pick can both go through the, both of those holes. I know that it'll be much easier to string on a necklace. Correction to the holes because they got a little ovoid or oval while doing that. So I'm going to go in here and just give a little correction. Like this again. So now I got a couple of holes in there. I'm just looking at the face of it to make sure it looks the way I want it to. Since I've worked so long and hard on this, I want this to be nice. So this is just very small detail that I'm working on right now. Just the So I'm just shaping where those holes are so that when I look at the front of the bead, they're not sticking out too far. Yep. 
So sometimes I have to remind myself it's just a demo. Okay, so now I'm gonna significantly heat this up and pull it off the back, sign my name, and I'll be finished. So for this, I'm gonna use another four mil rod. And actually my TA, Jeremiah, handed me a six mil rod because he saw the size of the piece. Thought that's what I would need, but I really like using the thin stuff. Just doing a really nice little cold seal on the front because I don't want to remove any of the pattern that I just put in all that time to make. So I'm fire cutting off the back. Oops, that's a sign of a good cold seal. It just came off at the wrong time. So I'm gonna start that over again. And what I did is this is a small handle, so I pulled significantly harder than I should have and it came off. should do for this is just crank that down, make it a little louder. So it'll go a little faster. I'm just at this point being extra careful. But when you be careful, you usually go a little slower. And this blue tubing is relatively stiff because of the cobalt glass that's in there. Put that down. And melt that tip in a little bit. So it doesn't hurt anybody later. Go back in there, I'm gonna pull a little of this glass off the back. It's a little bit much. And what am I looking for? Looking for my brain is what I'm looking for about this time. Um, sometimes that's harder to find than others. And I'm gonna put a couple initials on the back. So this is the signature, it's an H, and it's an S. Now this big flame, I'm going to shrink this all back down on the back and make this into a disc. of mine that seems to be here quite a bit, so I'm going to ask him to do something for me. Will you cut a small section of that about, maybe about 10 inches? Thank you, Tom. You don't got to be in a hurry. If you're in a hurry with the glass, usually things go wrong or you end up hurting yourself. We don't want that to happen. Thank you. And I'm just using this as a tool to blow into the glass. In case this shrinks down a little bit small, I'll be able to blow into it because it's open on both ends. And again, by using gravity, I'm gonna Allow this to shrink down, but I don't want them, I don't want it to collapse on itself because then it won't be hollow anymore. So I gotta be a little careful and I have this in my hand just in case I need to puff into it. And I might or I might not, we'll see. But if you have it in your hand, you know where to find it generally. So that's why I'm doing this in this hand. This is looking pretty good, so I might not need to use it. But if I was to use it, I'd use it in this fashion here. Blow into one of those holes. 
I'm being real careful not to get into the holes that I made on the top of this. So that's where I really shrink it down until it gets right near those holes. If I get into those holes, they'll become elongated and look weird. So maybe I will use this. This looks pretty good. So now the last thing I gotta do is take off the punty on the front and remove the punty mark. So I'm gonna use this tool right here. Getting stuff out of the way. And this is a little big, so I'm probably just gonna use this technique here by cooling it down a little bit with it tweezers and give it a little tap. I'm going to take the face of this and be really careful with a small flame because this did cool down significantly. Put a little heat into it and remove that punty mark and I will be done. But I'm being really slow and methodical at the end here because this is usually when things go wrong, right at the very end. And since you saw how much time I put into this, I'm actually shaking a little bit. And that's just because of my own amount of work that I put into this, I got a little nervous. And so even after 27 years, I shake a little bit. I am done, and once it cools down, you'll be able to see the colors that are in there. This is a lot of small detail. Actually, I see a little bit something I need to fix on it real quick. I left a little indention from the punty. I melted it smooth, but it still has a little indention, so I'm just gonna go back in the flame real quick. With the bore silicate work on the torch, we really don't cold work things, so we wanna do everything hot, so that little bit of detail is something in other disciplines of glass you'd probably cold work, but here we do it all hot. So I'm looking at the reflection of the lights. They got brand new LED lights in the studio here, so it's very bright and nice, so I get to see the surface of the glass quite a bit. And I don't know where you would like this so you could see this. Okay. Just hold it up or leave it down. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you. And that's it, guys.